to the next speaker, uh, Professor Dan Beer. Um, he's the head of the laboratory nanomedicine and the Department of the Cell Research and Immunology in the uh, WB University, and also the director of the Leona M. and Harry Hemsley Now Technology Research Foundation in Tel Aviv. So his talk is to target, not to target, lessons from RNA based targeted lipid nanoparticles. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, um, so you see the title is a bit provocative, and I hope by the end of my talk, uh, which is uh, very short, uh, we will gain some, some information about this. I'm gonna talk mainly about how we would like to think a little bit out of the box. So our lab is studying how to manipulate cellular function in order to generate novel therapeutic approach, many leukocytes implicate the diseases. It's a huge field that include blood cancer, inflammation, and viral infection. And basically, we are a bit occupied in each of those buckets. So it's actually, uh, we have two kind of groups inside our group. One of them is more focusing on the delivery strategies, including uh, protein engineering, which is very, very important. And the other part is basically doing biology to identify new drug targets and ideally to combine those two. If this will work. Doesn't work, it does work. Okay, good. So the idea is to try to decipher gene function and, and we try to do it, it's a long process, but we're trying to do it with, with nucleic acid, mostly with RNA and we are, as I mentioned, mostly focusing on lymphocytes or leukocytes in general, but look at this. This is an illustration of a lymphocyte, and the majority, about 80, 85% is a nucleus. It means that, you know, there is lot, not a lot of work here to do for, for example, RNA or messenger RNA. But if it's an activated form, again, it's about 75% is a nucleus. So, Again, there is not a lot of space. This is why primary leukocytes are very hard to transduce. And basically, you know, all the requirements from leukocytes is similar to others. For example, efficient encapsulation, uh, specificity, targeted delivery platform, you know, evading clearance mechanism, which I'm going to talk very, very little. Avoiding toxicity and immune activation. But it's actually more complex. It's not only immune activation, it could be also immune suppression. So I think this is a huge challenge, and I'm going to show you some, you know, some old data and some new data about this. Not, not everything is. I mean, what I'm going to talk to, about today will be it's published, but, but basically this is a great challenge, and people are diminishing this thing because at the end of the day, the immune system will react, even uh, to, to things that we don't really understand. For example, for some reason, IL-8 has been expressed when you inject liposomes. And when you continue to inject in human, it's expressed, and it's highly expressed. What's going on? Are we creating a global inflammation event? We don't know. And it's happening even if IL-6 is not expressed. So I think this is just one of the things we are now learning, how the immune system is really looking at those creatures, those nano-creatures, and carrier internalization, et cetera, exosomal escape, everything is important. I want to give you two examples, very short. One of them was published many years ago, but still interesting because I'm going to talk about cyclin D1. This is a very interesting gene. It's apparently upregulated during inflammatory bowel disease, both in the epithelial cells, and now we also know that it's also happening in immune cells. And we, uh, many years ago, created a strategy to target gut mononuclear leukocytes and try to silence cyclin D1 in an experimental colitis model. The idea behind this was that Cyclin D1 was involved in proliferation of normal and malignant cells. And there were manuscripts in a very high profile journals that actually said that, you know, proliferation is conjugated to migration of leukocytes. This is completely incorrect. But it took us a few years to understand why. So we thought that if we will block cyclin D1 in a very specific manner, the proliferation will be diminished and therefore also the migration of leukocytes from the circulation into the gut. And what I'm going to show is that it's not correct. So basically we developed this liposomal version. We put an antibody. We created an antibody against integrin beta 7 and we show that we can uh, not only uh, deliver for primary lymphocytes which actually 
uh, we can do it very selectively because the sRNA is not entering primary lymphocytes. And if we put an isotype control on the particle, it will not enter. And we did it under flow condition. And this was the first time that we did a comparison with a knockout. So the beta-7 is a homing receptor. It is expressed on lymphocyte at home to the gut. And basically, you see here a black image. So this was a, a, a good comparison. And we found that in a very interesting mechanism that cyclin D1 is basically blocking, very specifically D1, not D2 and not D3, is blocking uh, some of the pro-inflammatory cytokines, but not the anti-inflammatory. And we are hopefully finish up a, a paper and a final revision step that is in cell with actually going to the mechanism behind this. So it took many, many years. And we also show that, you know, basically we can block the, the intestinal inflammation. But remember, cyclin D1 is an important target. And, and what happened eventually uh, became a new drug because uh, Genentech were interested in the antibody that we developed, and, and it's now entrolizumab. It's a very nice competitor to the veloduzumab of Takeda, but basically came from the same lab. So uh, good for everyone. Now remember cyclin D1 because it's important. I'm going to turn to another disease called mantle cell lymphoma. And this work was done predominantly by, by a graduate, former graduate student and a f two former graduate students of mine. And this is an aggressive form of a B cells non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, quite rare, about 6% of the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And it's one of the poorest among the B cells in terms of their survival. And basically, it has a genetic hallmark where uh, the gene that encodes for cyclin D1, CCN D1, juxtaposed to the heavy chain uh, uh, area in the genome, chromosome 14, in 85% of the patient. Therefore, in theory, you can actually develop a drug based on this because they are highly expressing more than 15,000 fold as for normal B cells. So normal B cells do not proliferate through cyclin D1. We know that they are proliferating through cyclin D2 and D3. And we collaborated uh, back then with uh, George Delay, so Mark Delay, also George, a different uh, guy, uh, from the Broad Institute, we sequenced 80 patients and we revealed two transcripts, the short and the long transcript uh, of the messenger of cyclin D1. And together with Alnylan Pharmaceutical, we screened about a little more than 500 uh, sequences and we found, I mean, this girl did it, so it's a lot of work. This is why she quit, I think, the field and went to medicine. She's a physician now. Uh, but anyhow, we found a very potent sequence that is uh, really amazing, is, is in a single-digit picomolar concentration, very specific, that broke the proliferation, uh, uh, sorry, broke the proliferation and, and create a cell arrest that include at the end cell death cascade. But I gave them, the two graduate students, a very nice job. I said, you know, now we have something in hands, but we need to develop something that will be more specific and we can systemically administrate this. And what we have done, we first saw that there is no model that we can use. So all the model for mantle cell lymphoma is basically taking the cells, doing them sub-Q, and look at the cell growth. So uh, we stably transfect them with GFP, and we basically had the model. We calibrate this. I mean, they calibrate this. And it took a few years, but we had a very nice model. You can see in the bone here the tumor is growing. About 45% of the injected dose goes to the bone marrow of the cell. So this is a very, very robust model. Of course, you have a little bit in the liver, a little bit in the blood, a little bit in, in the uh, lungs, etc. But the majority goes here. And what happened is that, you know, after 45 days or less, sorry, after uh, 30 days, these mice will die or between 24 to, uh, 24 to 30 days. And we were, we were interested also to choose the receptor targets for mantle cells. So we screened a few in cell lines of mantle cell, and we identified that CD38 is a good option. Here we had some collaboration with Sanofi that gave us the antibody. And what you can see here is the first evidence that their antibody that was recently approved for multiple myeloma is actually targeting in vivo very nicely in this uh, model the bone marrow. And if we actually sort the cells, we can see the antibodies labeled in red. You can actually see they're penetrating. So it's a very nice uh, observation. And what we have done, we used, um, here I'm doing some promotion. I don't have time, so I'll do it very quickly. Quickly, We used the nanoassembler that is presented here, um, here outside. 
okay? And James is probably around. But uh, basically, we use it to package the siRNAs, and you can read some of the papers that we published. And, uh, and this is a good way. And then we decorate the surface with uh, this anti-CD38 antibody, and we streamline recently this process, so we can do everything on this, of, on this uh, uh, platform. And you get a very nice oriented approaches. And we tested, we uh, create competition, between uh, free and blocking anti-CD38, and we saw it's very specific. We use a, a co-culture system with cells that lack the receptors and cells that do have the receptors, and showed specificity. I don't know if you can see it, but these guys actually enter the cell where the others are not. This is under shear flow conditions. So in general, it looks very nicely, and we block the cell cycle, and I'm off time. Okay, and we did a very interesting experiment that was completely blinded in Charles River. So it's a bit expensive, but I think it's worth it. And these are the results. These are IV injections given, you see, almost uh, like the first one was five days after the, the implantation of the cells, which are IV injected as well. And what you can see here, that this is one gene, only cycling D1. So this, the mice eventually will die. And that means you need combination therapy, which is not secret, everyone knows. But still, it's very interesting. Now, this is a platform. And again, since we don't have a lot of time, but we created a new antibody that actually take any isotype on the surface. So basically, with the new antibody that we uh, developed, and that was developed together with Professor Itai Benar at Tel Aviv University, we can actually conjugate to the surface and just mix it with any antibody that goes into different direction. There is another paper on the run. So, to target or not to target really relates to the target. So, we are advocates of lymphocytes as the best delivery system, but we need to avoid mononuclear phagocytes, and this is a Moghimi picture. I'm not sure it's Moin, but uh, yeah, with hair. Okay, and this is basically uh, the idea behind this is to decorate the surface with PEG, which is usually what people are doing to avoid mononuclear phagocytes. We need high specificity, we need a proof avidity, and in the case of nucleic acid, we need fast internalization and burst release. And if we have all this, that will be great. But in our case, it's really a clone-specific issue. So it needs to be very, very specific to the area, to the epitope that is the ligand binding epitope that creates this internalization. And in the, in the example of the beta-7 integrin, we have screened more than 20 different antibodies to get one that will be internalizing very quickly. And very quickly is 45 seconds in human T cells. So this is quick. Okay, at the end, just the people that are doing the job and the funding agency, and thank you all for listening. Thank you very much. So let's move to our last.